All right, well, I wanna thank you guys for coming out to our uh, bicentennial event today. Uh, we are celebrating the Illinois Bicentennial at Moraine Valley this year. It will culminate um, December 3rd. We'll be back here for a Democracy Hour talk that will essentially look at the Illinois preamble of the Constitution and determine if it's still viable today. And then following that discussion, we'll have a little birthday party over in the, um, in the lounge over there uh, to actually celebrate the day, which is December 3rd. So we hope you guys come back for that. Uh, we want to thank uh, Dr. John Lau for being with us today. Uh, he is the author of this book here called Imprints, The Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians and the City of Chicago. So he uh, has done some research and is an expert on that in, in our area. And um, part of the bicentennial has been to explore kind of the past history of the state, uh, specifically this area. So we're happy to welcome him here and look forward to what he has to share with us. So please welcome John Lau. Well, thank you. Uh, So it kind of creeps me out that nobody's sitting uh, closer to me. Um, <laughs> uh, would there, I, I don't want to be too disruptive, but uh, anyway, if, if, I, if I move into the third row, uh, you'll understand uh, why. Uh, so, uh, Buju, Nijniga, hello, how are you? Uh, John Lau Dejnikas, my name is uh, John Lau. Um, and uh, let's see, Mishke Meknek Dodem, I'm Turtle Clan, Pokegnek Bodwatomi, Citizen Pokegan Band um, of Indians. Um, and uh, 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 Nishnabe, I'm a human being. So, uh, great to be here, very honored to be here. And uh, 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 so we're celebrating. Um, what was the celebration again? Illinois Bicentennial. Illinois Bicentennial? Sure, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we should also be celebrating, it is, by the way, Native American Indian Heritage Month. And so uh, we can celebrate that also. And so I am a professor at Ohio State. Um, very impressed with the facilities that you have here. Uh, and so I wrote a book, uh, it's my first book, uh, 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 it's something I wanted to do uh, because I am a citizen of the Pokagon Band. I grew up in that community, I grew up, anyone know where South Bend, Indiana is? Um, and uh, uh, so I grew up just north of there in Michigan and was always uh, fascinated by our connections to our ancestral lands of, uh, of Chicago. And I call these areas, really the uh, entire Midwest, a scatter zone. Uh, because there were different events that happened with different uh, tribal peoples, tribal nations. Uh, we were, uh, some were forcibly removed, particularly after passage of the Congress's 1830 Indian Removal Act. Uh, there were people that were killed. There were people that died. There were people that fled, people that voluntarily migrated. Uh, to get away f uh, from uh, what I call PEDs in my classes, uh, PEDs, people of European descent. So I got tired of calling people white people or Euro-Americans or colonists or settlers or so I just went with PEDs, which makes the Mayflower what? The first PEDs dispenser. <laughs> okay, there we go. I've already hit the high point of my semester <laughs> class, so no need for you to enroll over at uh, Ohio State. Uh, you've already hit the high, high mark. Uh, so, and I will mention that that joke killed at the Eigel Jorg last week. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, there was uh, strategic accommodation, resistance, assimilation, all sorts of things. But as I tell my students uh, in my classes, I'm a historian. Uh, I teach a lot of literature because I want a job and that's the job they offer me. <laughs> I uh, also teach, uh, I'm the coordinator for American Indian Studies minor uh, at Ohio State. And um, 
So I uh, talked to students there because Indians really aren't on anybody's radar there, much less so than I suspect even here. But uh, you know, there's no reservations in Ohio, no reservations in Pennsylvania, there's no reservations in West Virginia, no Indian reservations in Kentucky, no Indian reservations in Tennessee, no Indian reservations in uh, Indiana, no Indian reservations in Illinois. And why was that? It's an interesting thing since this is, was the epicenter, one of the epicenters, certainly east of the Mississippi, an epicenter, this whole area of uh, native population, native peoples, because of the great resources, the somewhat temperate climate, although it always feels a lot more temperate in spring and fall, right, than in summer and winter, but temperate climate, good growing season. So, lots of water, which meant uh, uh, lots of uh, ways to travel uh, because those were the highways. So what happened to those people? Well, they all got moved out, right? So uh, most of them did. But I call it a scatter zone because some of us fled. So my community fled and negotiated a way of avoiding removal by becoming Catholic, right? So um, we're not as strongly Catholic as we used to be probably but Notre Dame, for instance, was founded to um, uh, do mission work with my community, right? And they were there to educate us. We try to remind them about that when they, uh, 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 when we make our annual claim for free tuition, but they always ignore us. But uh, that's Notre Dame. Anyway, so I wanted to write this book because I wanted to capture those stories that fascinated me so much. Uh, I also wanted to write the book because I wanted to get tenure. <laughs> and, uh, and in academia, that's how you get tenure. You get semi-job security, right, is uh, by uh, writing your book. I should announce, though, as I was uh, coming down here, uh, my next book, I'm going to change it. Uh, I think it's going to be um, uh, the Pokagon Potawatomi and the uh, city of Palos Heights. I think that's what I'm going to do, yeah, yeah. Palos. or Palos Hills. Is it Palos Hills or Palos Hills? Palos Hills, okay. Um, and maybe I'll call it, instead of in prints, Moraine, right? You know, so there we go. Actually, that's not sounding too bad. Um, so <laughs> uh, anyway, this is a talk about the book. I wanted to give you an introduction to the book. I uh, warned uh, my handlers when I first got here uh, that uh, Troy and uh, others uh, that uh, I teach generally, on, I've been for six years at Ohio State, 80 minute uh, class, every class, every semester, every year, no changes. And so I'm on an 80 minute time clock, body clock, right? So I get in front of an audience, put me in front of an audience and I talk for 80 minutes. Uh, so that could be dangerous here, right? Because I'd like to end around noon and uh, give you a chance for questions. Still working? Yeah, okay. And, uh, but it's improved because I used to teach at UIC with a, where I taught once a week for three hours, so it could be worse. You know, I could be, you know, it'd be two o'clock and I'd be winding things up. Anyway, so, uh, essentially the book, Sorry about the text-heavy uh, stuff. Uh, I promise I won't do it too often. Sometimes my fingers get near a keyboard and I just can't help myself. But uh, essentially, the book is about uh, the American Indian experience in Chicago, specifically the, the Potawatomi, more specifically the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. And so it's divided into chapters. Uh, it talks about our presence early history, and uh, then talks uh, about uh, Simon Pokagon, the son of our patriarch uh, that uh, spoke at the World Columbian Exposition in front of 70,000 people. So every time I get in front of a large group and I think, wow, should I be nervous? I just think about Simon, you know, 70,000 people, if he could do it, you know, I have a responsibility to do it too. So, uh, and his uh, daughter, uh, Julia, continued uh, this presence, maintaining a presence, uh, disrupting the myth and the idea 
of the vanishing Indian, that we were refusing to go away. We had avoided removal, and we were refusing to go away. And so uh, encampments at Lincoln Park that would uh, culminate in land claims to the Chicago Lakefront. How many knew that uh, the Chicago Lakefront had been disputed lands and that Indians and other people had sued over its ownership? Yeah, I mean, um, my grandmother told me, my uh, Potawatomi grandmother, uh, and, uh, but I knew that this was e e within my own community until I wrote the book. Uh, it was not all that well known. And then uh, Leroy, we saw Chicago uh, Canoe Club. And uh, so uh, I wanted to pick out periods of times uh, that uh, reflected that we uh, continued to maintain a presence here, even though we were pushed off into what is now Southwest Michigan and Northwest Indiana. So I should mention too, that uh, my book was, uh, I'm not sure why, it's not a relative of mine. I actually don't really know him very well, but our director, tribal director of uh, Department of Education, when the book came out from Michigan State Press, he bought um, a copy for every Pokagon Potawatomi household, which was like uh, uh, 2,000 books which, you know, I only get 10 cents per book, so that wasn't the big deal. But for one day, I was the number one indigenous bookseller on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, um, so, I give a little uh, 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 context. Is that, and probably, hopefully, uh, you should know this, is that, you know, we're Illinois, right? Uh, the, uh, Illini Confederacy uh, uh, was uh, uh, groups of tribes, right? Three Fires Confederacy, which uh, were uh, my people, and, and other Great Lakes tribes. So this was a very populated area. But it was also an area that was defined not so much by nationhood as by clan identity. And so that made it very complicated and uh, confusing for PEDS because I'm Turtle Clan, so I might feel more of a rights and responsibilities and obligations to a Turtle Clan Miami person or a Turtle Clan Menominee person than to a Bear Clan uh, Potawatomi person because my clan identity was very important, right? And so, and that was passed down. And uh, uh, patrilineal. Um, and so that made it difficult when uh, the United States, when previous, the French, the British, whenever anybody wanted to enter into treaties or agreements with us, they wanted, who's your leader? Take us to your leader. Uh, what do you call your nation? Okay, well, we call ourselves the Anishinaabe. And what's that mean? We're human beings. Well, okay. Uh, what about, uh, what about you people? Oh, the Menominee, we're the people of the wild rice. Um, uh, the Miami, uh, the Mia Mia uh, people. Oh, well, we're the original people that went south. You know, how, how do we make a treaty like that? You know, so they uh, insisted that uh, we develop, and they had ways of doing that, basically through the treaty process of uh, configuring people to uh, develop national identities. So. This was our Potawatomi territory uh, during the sort of our high point, golden era. Uh, Door County, Wisconsin to the north, down uh, close to Champaign-Urbana, uh, Chicago, certainly this area, up uh, northwest Indiana, a large swath, large swath in southern Michigan, uh, and into the Maumee River Valley of uh, Ohio. This was not exclusive. We didn't view land and ter territory that way. Uh, land was a relative, Nook Muskegonon, um, Grandmother Earth. Uh, and it was not a commodity, but it was a resource uh, to be used. Uh, and there would be claims uh, within the community and uh, um, 
intertribal claims too, to, well, this is our like the, the fish, or this is our blueberry patch to pick. Uh, but there's never a sense of, oh, well, you cross that line, you just crossed a border, you know, so it's on, right? So it was never like that. So, and that confused Europeans too, and Americans, uh, because they wanted nice, tight little boundaries. And so they had to make multiple treaties over, mul you know, the same area of land with multiple tribes. Uh, so, but, so here's Chicago, Chicago River. Uh, I like to think of this as probably my relatives. And uh, so, uh, again, that's our patriarch. And I uh, apologize for looking at my watch, but the clock up here, it says 1.34. So um, <laughs> look at this instead. Um, is it, well, I guess that's only an hour off, right? Okay. Till three, three. Okay. Um, so Leopold Pokagan, uh, adopted son of Tatnaby uh, in the 1820s, uh, married uh, Tatnaby's daughter, and uh, became a leader of his own within the tribe. We didn't have uh, hereditary leaders. Uh, you led by strength and example and success. We had civil chiefs and war chiefs. Uh, people served at the uh, pleasure of the people. If there was uh, um, gridlock and division and 51, 49% votes and that kind of stuff like we have today, uh, there was enough land back then, as my grandmother tells me, my other elders tell me, that the group that was dissatisfied with how things were going would always, there was always, you could go over the hill and set up another village, right? And so they did. So that's how we spread from village to village. So uh, Leopold Pokagan was, uh, along with all of the other tribes of the area, were called to a uh, treaty uh, negotiation in uh, uh, Chicago, 1833, the last of a series of treaties. It was going to be the last, it was going to be the Removal Treaty. This was after 1830 with the Indian Removal Act, as I mentioned. This was uh, after 1832 in the Black Hawk uh, Uprising. And uh, so it was decided pretty much that uh, Indians couldn't stay, even friendly Indians. And the Potawatomi had not been all that friendly. We had been at the Battle of Fallen Timbers uh, in Ohio. We had been at the um, Prophetstown. We had been at the Battle of Fort Dearborn. We had been at the Battle of the Thames. We had been at the Siege of uh, Detroit. We'd been, uh, many um, of the Potawatomi had resisted incursion of uh, PEDS into our territories, but uh, it, Here a canal gets built, uh, immigration's a tsunami. Uh, no matter uh, how many times you resist, there's always more PEDS to fill in the spots. And so uh, people had to figure out their own ways to survive and for their people to survive. And so, uh, and sometimes I get asked by students, well, why would you, why would you go to a treaty negotiation if you didn't want to uh, enter into a treaty? Because treaties had started out as uh, uh, nation to nation negotiations, right? One sovereign recognizing another sovereign's right to uh, participate in this diplomacy. And so those treaties early on in the United States on the East uh, Coast were treaties of peace and treaties of alliance and treaties of trade. But by the 1830s, they were treaties of land cession and treaties of loss and treaties of removal. Right? And so, again, students say, well, why go to a treaty like that? Well, the problem is the treaty negotiator, negotiators would say, we're going to have the treaty negotiations whether you're there or not. Someone's going to come. Someone's going to enjoy the barrels of whiskey. Somebody's going to sign. Somebody's going to get a bunch of gifts. And somebody's going to claim to be your leader and sign away everything. So if you don't come, you lose your chance to get your best deal. Sounds like a used car salesman, right? You know, it's like you get your best deal, you know, uh, but it was, that was fact of life. 
So Indians could not ignore these treaty negotiations. So Leopold came. Leopold had uh, converted along with his village, as I mentioned, to Catholicism a few years earlier. So he was a teetotaler, the only Catholic I know that's a teetotaler. Um, and I'm Catholic, so I can, uh, I can speak of my own people. So, uh, no, not, no. anyway, he was a teetotaler. And so he stayed away from all the other Indians, and he stayed away from the whiskey traders. And uh, so the negotiations went on, and uh, a lot of promises were made by the United States government. Most of them never kept about annuities, about assistance and removal, that sort of thing. And, uh, but in exchange, we get the land, the last sliver of land. And so Pokagon then uh, participated in those negotiations, but then came back to the negotiators the next day and uh, asked to have an addendum to the treaty. That would say that because of our creed, Christian, Catholic, uh, that we should not be removed. And uh, the negotiators agreed. And so we were actually supposed to be moved further north, but the federal government never came up with the funds to move us, so we just went back home and we've stayed there ever since. And so uh, we were one of the tribes that avoided removal. Simon Polkagan, as I mentioned, was his uh, son. Simon was kind of a trickster character in that um, he spoke to his audience, right? He knew his audience, and he knew how to uh, be a popular speaker. So if he was uh, speaking to a group of um, friends of the Indian on the Gold Coast in Chicago, he would talk about the need for Indians to be sober and to be uh, good citizens, become good citizens of the United States and uh, drop the bow and arrow and pick up the plow uh, kind of stuff, right? Because that's what they wanted to hear, that Indians were willing to assimilate. Friends of the Indians, that progressive group that came out of the whole abolition movement, the suffrage uh, movement, um, anti-poverty movements, um, anti-war movements, and the Friends of the Indians have never really been friends of the Indian. They've been friends of the assimilated Indian. So, but he was willing to do that. But if he was in an audience that was willing to listen to him, he would talk about how we have no cause to celebrate uh, with you today. And that's what he said at the Columbian Exposition, is that we have no reason to celebrate. He wrote that uh, he, uh, on the Midway, what is that, uh, 59th Street, 60th Street in Chicago, uh, south of uh, the U, U of Chicago campus is the Midway. It's the first Midway. It's why Midways are called Midways at uh, um, uh, f outdoor festivals and stuff, is that was the first Midway. And uh, so he, no Indians were invited uh, to the Columbian Exposition. So, and he was really ticked off about that. So he came, he was living about uh, 80 miles away, southwest Michigan. And so he came and he uh, was published on uh, birch bark, very thin. Why on birch bark? Uh, well, in the book I talk about it, is that uh, one is that uh, wigwas, birch bark is a sacred material to us. Most sacred of things are put on birch bark. Our birch bark scrolls are testaments about our spirituality. It also, it builds our homes, right, birch bark. It builds our canoes, right, where ideas and things and people move back and forth. Uh, it's what we cradle our babies in. It's what we're wrapped in when we die and we're buried, right? So wigwas, birch bark, has a very important message to us as Indian people. But it also is quite a tourist attraction kind of thing, right? And so he sold these and was making a little money. And so uh, it was um, essentially... In the book, uh, he says, and I'll just summarize it, is that um, no sooner would we hold uh, the high joy day over the graves of our departed than to celebrate our own funeral, the discovery of America. And while your hearts in admiration rejoice over the beauty and grandeur of this young republic, and you say, behold the wonders wrought by our children in this foreign land, 
Do not forget that this success has been at the sacrifice of our homes and a once happy race. So, you can't really call him, uh, you know, an appeasement, uh, you know, that he was uh, 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 kissing their uh, behinds. Um, but uh, so, but they kind of like that too. You know, they, you know, that, that was popular enough. You know, th they like the uh, well-spoken Indian. They like the um, resistant Indian once the resistant Indian is dead, particularly if it's military resistance, right? Um, and they like the um, uh, Indian that is willing to sort of speak up when there's really no chance. Nobody's really going to pay too much attention. But anyway, so he, uh, I found this um, for sh uh, quite a while ago um, uh, in a book about the Chicago uh, Columbian Exposition. And there was Chicago Day. And lo and behold, there's Simon Pokagan. And, you know, he's not dressed. Here's... Uh, uh, John Fox, I think he's the nominee, and he's just like what what you're supposed to be, right? In the postcards, he's a tourist attraction Indian, right? That's not uh, uh, 1893. No, nobody's dressing like that in 1893, except uh, for tourists. This is what an American Indian looks like, right? Uh, dressed like everybody else. And this was one of the friends of the Indians in between them. Some group of Californians <laughs> there, uh, and then a, uh, a mock-up of the Liberty Bell that they all got to ring. So, a little odd, but anyway, so he spoke. And um, so, uh, an advertisement. He tried to make money uh, being a writer. He tried to be a... Uh, uh, public speaker, make a writer, m or making uh, making uh, speeches. Trying to make a living, it was a very hard scrabble life. The rest of us during this time were embedding ourselves in the economy. There's an article by a uh, uh, historian, uh, Ben Segunda, from Notre Dame that talks about uh, to seed or to seed, C-E-D-E -E versus S-E-E-D, right? And so it's better than giving up the land, become agriculturalists. Well, we were all right. we'd been farmers for thousands of years, but we had to do it like white people did it, right? Like the Peds did it. So we became uh, farmers. We also became the f first uh, uh, fruit and vegetable pickers. We became tourist attractions in our own right, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, we also... Uh, became factory workers with the Industrial Revolution. And so we were embedded in the economy, right? And so it made it difficult to get rid of us. So uh, there's uh, the book. Simon wrote the second book ever written in Western form uh, by a American Indian. <coughs> First was James Schoolcraft, and he's the second. Ogmakwe Migwaki means, actually does not mean queen of the woods, it means female leader of a uh, woods with good spirit. But queen of the woods, so it was a mild hit. Didn't sell as many copies as my book did, but no, I'm just, anyway, so. And he would uh, talk, again, about whether or not we're a vanishing race. But when you're publishing books, you're not really much of a vanishing race, are you? And that was the stereotype of, uh, was that Indians are, they're going to be a quaint uh, part of our historical matrimony and patrimony, right? Uh, they'll be something that we can put on stamps and build statues about, but they'll be gone. Reservations were never intended to last forever. Reservations were holding pens for people before they starved to death or died of disease or died of despair or just gave up, right? As one of my elders once told me, it takes a lot of work to live. It's easy to die. You just give up. And so, uh, over in, um, uh, over by uh, L Plymouth, Indiana, uh, Twin Lakes, is a statue of Chief Menominee. Chief Menominee uh, did not negotiate a deal like Leopold Pokagan did. And so, as a result, in um, 
uh, soldiers, militia, local militia came, told the, uh, uh, his uh, tribal village that, uh, well, we've got gifts to give you, all, all of you gather at the church. So they gathered at the Christian church and the soldiers surrounded it and then uh, um, marched them out west, right? On a forced march first to Iowa and then on to Kansas. And so, and then after it's done, you know, the descendants, the sons, and I write about this, is the sons feel bad about the sins of the father and the mother. And so they put up white marble. I mean, they don't do any for anything for the Indians that are living out in Kansas and later on in Oklahoma, but, uh, but they put up a white marble statue to commemorate um, how badly uh, the Indians were treated. So. Uh, Julia Polkagan, Simon's daughter, so that's the granddaughter then of Leopold Polkagan. She has, she puts up her own monument. It's not marble. It's not dead. It's made, yes, birch bark, right? Wigwas, of course. Uh, this living material. She builds it. A lot of people think that we only lived in wigwams. We also lived in uh, conical shaped uh, homes and that's birch bark. And so uh, she uh, then, well, she spoke then and talked about how, again, you're here to celebrate uh, uh, this uh, Founders uh, Day. You're here to celebrate, uh, you know, the uh, successes that you've had. You've uh, come here to uh, cluck about how badly the Indians were treated. But, you know, it's not enough just to do that, right? It's not just enough to cluck about it and, and have a furrowed brow and then go on about your business. So, uh, she, uh, so uh, after her uh, father died, uh, the, the teepee, by the way, was in front of his home in Hartford, Michigan, and he'd charge you know, a penny to go in. And uh, so um, uh, it uh, was a minor tourist attraction. She donated it to Eastern Michigan University. And it, uh, so there's the installation. Uh, the young ladies of uh, uh, Eastern Michigan had uh, raised money to purchase it and to move it. So, uh, and it was postcard worthy, right? So I went to uh, Eastern Michigan, Ypsilanti, Michigan, sort of uh, an experience that uh, I remember uh, warmly is that I went up to special collections and I never until I got to grad school realized I didn't know what reference librarians did. You know, but I know now that they are dead tired of being asked where's the bathroom, right? Or uh, what time do you close? Um, you know, it drives them nuts. Um, They've, you know, they got their whole careers devoted to helping people, right? Uh, with the archives, with the mat library materials. And so I had an experience when I was in grad school in Ann Arbor uh, where I asked a librarian to sort of just give me an idea about a paper I had to write. I was, you know, this is my second career. I, I'm a lawyer too, uh, licensed to practice in Michigan, had been a tribal attorney, tribal council member, uh, politician, co-author of the Tribal Constitution, negotiated the gaming compact for our first casino in New Buffalo, Four Winds, which by the way, uh, if you get over there, every day is a lucky day at Four Winds for me. Um, and, uh, but it, that, you know, so then now we have four casinos, right? So, uh, but I, so I was restarting school, got bored with practicing law, want to uh, be in a more collaborative relationship rather than adversarial relationship with half the population I was dealing with. And so, um, uh, so I went to special collections and uh, asked the person there at Eastern Michigan, I thought it was gonna be a really stupid question. I said, <laughs> this is gonna be really bizarre, but there used to be a teepee on campus and um, it was from the Pokagans. And have you ever heard us? I swear, 
the guy goes down like this, pulls out his drawers, takes out a file that thick, says, I've been waiting 30 years. And I felt like going, what? <laughs> you know, like, for real? Because um, I almost didn't make it, you know? <laughs> um, but it had her handwritten type speech, typed by her hand. It was a little cross outs of things that she made. It had the design for the for the uh, the teepee. Uh, it had photos, newspaper coverage, everything. It was wonderful. And uh, so uh, I asked, "Well, where is it?" And he said, "Oh, it's in the attic of Old Main." And a lot of campuses, the old campuses, the administration building was always called Old Main. So I said, "Well, where's Old Main?" And he said, oh, well, it burned down in 1960. Um, so, oh, well, they didn't save the two. No, they didn't save that. Yeah. So uh, I've been trying to get my community to rebuild this. Um, but I think I have to be closer to home to exert political influence, right? You know, it's, it's easy for them to say, yeah, sure, John, to an email or a phone call and then just move on with their lives. But uh, anyway, so... Um, I also, in the book, deal with Frederick Jackson, Turner, and uh, Buffalo Bill. Uh, they came up with ideas of frontier. You know, this used to be the first West, right? This was the Northwest Territory, thus Northwestern, right? Uh, this was the frontier. This was the first West. And then it jumped the Mississippi up to the Rockies and then, you know, with the invasion of California and the gold rush, you know, there were multiple frontiers all throughout. But this was one of the first frontiers. And so Turner, during 1893, while Simon Polkagan was speaking about how uh, uh, Indians are still here, we haven't vanished, we may not be celebrating because we don't have a cause to celebrate like you all do, but we'd still like to be included. Uh, and we'd still like to be asked to the dance. Um, Turner was speaking. He was a uh, professor of history at U of Wisconsin. He was speaking inside at the Columbian Exposition about how uh, the, his frontier thesis was that American exceptionalism, if you believe in such a thing, Americans are exceptional because they participated in the conquering of the frontier through uh, ax and plow. It was through that conquest of nature, that sod busting, that tree clearing, that clear cutting, that created the uh, innovative spirit, the frontier spirit, the uh, adventuresome spirit that is uniquely American, is what he said, right? Uh, and he worried about the fact that, well, what's going to happen now that there's no more frontier? 1893, pretty much every place is settled. And then we got new frontiers, right? We uh, took over Hawaii, right? Uh, 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 violation of international law, but we took over Hawaii. We moved into Alaska, another new frontier. Then we got involved in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, um, Guam, um, Philippines. You know, so we kept trying to expand our frontiers. And finally, of course, you know, the most recent has been um, space, right? The final frontier, right? And uh, frontier to infinity. So we can always maintain our exceptionalism. But Cody had a different idea, you know, with his, he was really one of the, besides P.T. Barnum and circuses, he was the other sort of person. He created a historical, um, uh, reenactment of the uh, settling of America. And he said it was, you know, he didn't specifically, but it was not, he, the message was, it wasn't the plow and the axe, it was not conquering the environment, it was the Winchester rifle, the Colt revolver, and it was conquering people. That's what makes Americans exceptional. So it's not nature or space that we need to keep conquering. It's people we need to keep conquering. That's what makes us wonderful, right? So, 
But there were some others, uh, George Wellington Streeter, uh, you probably never heard of him, right? I presume. Uh, I go in Chicago. I'll be in uh, downtown the Gold Coast of Chicago. I'll be in a neighborhood, a very wealthy neighborhood that I probably shouldn't be in, um, called Streeterville. And I'll ask, do you know who George Streeter is? And nobody ever knows who he is. Well, it's named after him. And he, what happened after the uh, Chicago fire of 1871 was all that rubble was dumped into Lake Michigan. And it extended the shoreline east into the lake. Well, uh, he was, and I detail it, on various adventures. He was quite a uh, entrepreneur from Michigan. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and a fun character. Uh, I would have loved to have made, meet him. Um, and uh, so he came upon this barren stretch. That's what it looked like. That's what the Chicago lakefront looked like in 1910. Not too pretty, right? Looks like a landfill. Well, that's what it was, right? He, his, he ran upon it with his uh, nearly sinking boat and planted a flag on it and said, I've discovered new lands. And I'm going to call it the District of Michigan, and I'll be his first congressman. I'm also his governor. He, tried, he went to D.C. and tried to be admitted as the uh, congressman for the District of Lake Michigan. They wouldn't seat him. Uh, he sued, um, spent 30 years of his life. He also platted it. And that's the colonial project oftentimes is to map something first, divide it up, grid it, and then sell it, claim it and sell it, right? That's when you know that land's a commodity. So he started selling lots and he was making a ton of money. First year he made $50,000 back then, right? That was a ton of money. So uh, he became a folk hero. This was during uh, the era of the end of the Gilded Age, the end, end of uh, the fascination with the Industrial Revolution, but the rise of workers' uh, militant movements and the rise of unionism and the rise of people getting sick of fat cats, making, uh, 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 well, I always like to talk like the kids in my class. That, so they were making fat stacks. Um, they are making bank. Um, well, <laughs> so they uh, were making a lot of money off the backs of uh, hardworking people, right? And so the Pullmans, the, uh, um, the Armors, uh, all of the, the fields, all of these people. So, so Streeter became a folk hero as, you know, the little guy can still stick it to the big guy, right? And so this is Michael Williams, who was secretary of our uh, tribe. Wonderful uh, guy. I, I got his archives. He was a, uh, a bookkeeper for the tribe, and f well, for his profession, but he was also secretary and then chair for a tribe from about 1915 to about 1968. And uh, he kept a record about everything. And the wonderful thing was usually when you go to an archive, you only get half the letter. You get the letter that was received and you have to kind of read, well, what are they responding to? He carbon copied everything and then stapled them together or clipped them together. So you'd have both sides of the letter. Uh, 14 file cabinets in the back of the Williams house. Uh, and so the Potawatomi sued too. So Streeter sued on the idea that I discovered this land, and just like the Spanish and the French and the British, you landed on the East Coast and planted a flag and planted a cross and said you discover it in the name of the king or the queen and in the name of God, well, I planted my flag, I planted my cross, and so it's mine. Right? I'm just in the great grand tradition. Um, Potawatomi, oh, don't have the Potawatomi, on the other hand, argued that, well, that land was never ceded. It was never given away. We never ceded Lake Michigan. The boundaries in all the treaties Every treaty ever signed about Illinois 
uh, in the Potawatomi or any other tribe always uses the uh, longitude and latitudes, the meets and bounds, except with the shoreline. And it would just say the, the shoreline of to the shoreline of Lake Michigan. Well, so um, in uh, the 1833, the shoreline was about at Michigan Avenue. That's why Water Tower Place, that's a water pump, right? That's because the lake was there. So everything east of Michigan Avenue, which is about 10 blocks, uh, is Phil. So Lincoln Park, Jackson Park, the whole museum campus, Soldier Field, um, all of that is on Phil. And so uh, we sued saying we never seeded the lake. The fact that you put Phil on top of it, thank you very much. We already have stories about how you know there's a great flood and you know the earth rose back up on the back of a turtle uh, after Martin put soil on it. So I guess you were our modern day Martin and you put soil on the top of turtle's back. Miigwech, thank you, and we'd like to have our land back now. And so they sued all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. All the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so uh, we got a hearing in 1917, and uh, I got to read the um, biography of the uh, son of the lawyer that handled the case, uh, um, J.R. Grossberg. Uh, and uh, he, his quote was that the law was with me, uh, but the justices were against me. And so they said we had, a, we had a claim. If we had a claim, we abandoned the claim. Well, how do you abandon a claim to water? Like, were we supposed to keep canoes out there tied together for 70 years? You know, um, I don't know how, how um, you know, when we have ideas of uh, these are American waters or that's the international uh, line, w we don't keep ships Along. We don't abandon it, but they decided that we abandoned it. So I uh, come close to closing with about Leroy Wiesaw, who is here uh, from my community uh, and his family. He moved to Chicago to get a job as a trucker um, delivery person in about 1950. And so they lived in Chicago, uptown neighborhood. and. Uh, uh, so, but he stayed involved in community affairs, but he also got a job uh, at a uh, fiberglass fabricating company uh, by a guy that was also very, uh, Ralph Fries was his name, uh, the Chicago Canoe Livery, uh, and uh, he was very interested in Voyager reenactments, right? And so he's making all these Voyager canoes. and. The native people, Leroy Wiesaw was a member of the Chicago American Indian uh, Center, 120 different tribes that are very intertribal. And so, um, wanted to get uh, something, an activity that got the youth involved, got people inspired, and also sort of, again, just like Simon Polkagan, just like Julia Polkagan, just like the other people that were, just like the people that filed suit, we're always making our presence felt in Chicago, that we had not vanished, that we were still here. And so uh, he said, well, hey, Ralph, uh, could we fabricate some canoes too? Because we couldn't get enough birch bark and it took too long to make canoes the old way. So Ralph said, sure, we'd love to have some Indians <laughs> canoeing along with us. Well, that wasn't Leroy's vision, but, uh, but he wanted to have canoes. So they started cranking out canoes. So it became a social event and a sporting event. Um, the, um, they canoed around Manhattan Island. They canoed to the top of Niagara Falls. They canoed, uh, uh, they set the canoeing speed record from uh, New Buffalo to Chicago. Um, I'm not sure how they did that because I talked with one of the members uh, who is my age, uh, and uh, works for the uh, TSA now, and uh, said that, uh, well, now this was just the beginning of the Red Power Movement and the beginning of young people thinking that Indians were cool 
So we didn't have to be ashamed anymore. People didn't call us Buck or Chief or Injun or, um, uh, you know, Red N-Word, you know. Um, we were cool now because they were dressing like us in buckskin and they were growing their hair long. So we started growing our hair long, you know, and our hair's better, you know. And, and we'd have braids, you know. And then we got these silk jackets. Leroy got us these silk jackets back in the 70s. Silk jackets were all the rage, right? A Chicago Canoe Club. And he said, you know, we'd pull up to some event and um, everybody just swarmed us. You know, a lot of them were uh, very interested in uh, um, checking out the young ladies. And they said, you know, it was, it was awesome. We were like rock stars. Until we got in the water, the fiberglass is really heavy and we weren't very good at it. We didn't practice all that much and so we usually finished last. But even though we finished last, people still loved us. And so, um, so it was a good experience. And again, it uh, uh, kept the idea alive. So uh, this was uh, in 2010, Chicago Indian Center. That's Matt. We saw the Pokagon Tribal Chairman. That was Joe Palazic. Joe Palazic now is at Trickster Gallery in Schaumburg. He was the uh, head of the Chicago American Indian Center back in 2010. And we're presenting our tribal flag to be held uh, or hung from the rafters at uh, the Indian Center, which now has moved, of course, so I'm not sure where it's at. But anyway, it was a big moment. And they had an honor dance for uh, Leroy, which they'd never done. They'd really never, the community never acknowledged what he had done to the community. He's walked on, of course, he's passed away now. So, and so the last thing I'll close with in a couple of minutes, is um, anyone familiar with the Fort Dearborn Massacre Monument? Ever seen that image or that picture? Uh, don't have any other images. Anyway, it used to be in Chicago. Uh, it used to be at about uh, 18th Street. And it, uh, George Pullman, or Pullman Railway Car fame, had commissioned it and had it in front of his house. And it was supposed to be where the massacre happened. And uh, one of the four stars on the Chicago city flag commemorates the Fort Dearborn massacre. Books for 100 years had taught uh, school-aged children in Chicago. The only thing they knew about Indians is that they didn't exist anymore and that they had massacred peds at Fort Dearborn. Right? That was the message. So. Um, but it really wasn't, you know, I was always told from a youngster that it wasn't a massacre, it was a battle. And as Simon Pokagan wrote in one of his uh, articles, he would publish a lot, he said, you know, it's funny, whenever, whenever Indians win a battle, it's a massacre. Whenever whites win a battle, it's, it's a war, you know. And uh, so, you know, there seems to be something uh, contradictory there or hypocritical. But... So this is, uh, this is supposed to be Black Partridge saving Mrs. Kinsey from the tomahawk of some anonymous Potawatomi Indian, right? Quite active, right? Really sends a message, right? Savagery, red savagery, the noble Indian versus the savage Indian, the helpless woman representing America, Right? And that whatever we did to Indians, we had to do to Indians. Because otherwise, that's what they were going to do to us. Right? We weren't always going to have black partridge there to save us. And so, um, but it's just all made up. It's just conjured up that event. That event, nobody knows whether it happened. Only Mrs. Kinsey remembers it. But they didn't interview a lot of Potawatomi. But we do know that the Fort Dearborn um, battle started uh, uh, in 1812, in uh, August of 1812, uh, that uh, the uh, Fort Wayne general told the commandant at uh, Fort Dearborn to evacuate the fort. Why, you know, this is at the edge of a military zone, right? That, and why they would have women and children there seems really odd to me. But the Americans had their families 
they're in a uh, military zone. So they uh, negotiate with the Potawatomi to be able to leave freely. And they say, we'll give you all of your, our goods and we'll give you our gunpowder. And so um, the morning that they departed, they d the Americans dumped all of it into the well at the fort instead and ruined it, destroyed it, instead of giving it to the Indians as promised. The gunpowder was an important factor, not because, oh, well, we can use it in battle. Gunpowder was important because Indians couldn't replicate gunpowder, right, at that point in their history. And gunpowder was important for hunting. And the game was getting really scarce at this point. And so that gunpowder meant the difference sometimes whether you're going to feed your family or whether they weren't going to eat. And so that gunpowder was important. So when they left and the Indians discovered that, uh, uh, well, uh, you lied to us once again. So uh, they f the Potawatomi followed them uh, down along the shore of Lake Michigan as they s the group was starting to walk towards Fort Wayne. And then uh, the commandant of the uh, garrison could see the Indians and thought he'd be a preemptive strike. There was a nearby Potawatomi village, you know, a small temporary thing. He, he ordered his soldiers on their horses, let's attack the village. We'll distract them by uh, attacking their women and children. Well, that didn't go very well, right? And it didn't go over very well either. So then uh, it was on like Donkey Kong, right? You know, then, you know, the power, okay, you take our women and children, you know, so it, and all bets are off. So they attacked the, um, so it was a battle. It wasn't a particularly pretty battle. This was an area of conquest. But in 2016, this is way over here is the lake shore. This is, this used to be, that statue got pulled uh, from that neighborhood as that neighborhood, um, the demographics changed and white people left. Well, we can't have this priceless statue um, there anymore. So it got moved to the Chicago History Museum. And then in the 70s, it got moved from there as the Chicago Indian community said, we don't like this offensive statue there. So they put it in storage where it is today. It's in storage somewhere. And so, but there was this little green space where the attack was by the developers here. And they had written uh, a letter talking about, uh, and it was some, you know, I have a Google search for anything about Pokagans and Potawatomi. Anyway, it came up, and it was like the online Chicago reader. And the uh, uh, real estate developer was saying, well, I think we're going to call this Fort Dearborn Massacre Park. And we're going to see if we can get the statue put back up there. And so I responded, not expecting any reply. I responded with, well, why don't you ask the Potawatomi about it, right? Why aren't we participating in this? And to my surprise, he wrote back in an email and said, we'd love to have you participate. And so we did. And I remember us meeting at uh, a place nearby there, a little coffee house, with various stakeholders, and uh, there was one person, you know, so the vote was basically 50-50, new name, a Battle of Fort Dearborn Park, which I came up with, uh, and no statue versus massacre of Fort Dearborn Park and the statue. And it was like we had nine people there and it was four and four. And then the um, deciding vote, and it sounds like a clue game, but it was a uh, lieutenant from the local National Guard that was within a block there of the, their armory, and he was Lieutenant Purple. And Lieutenant Purple voted with us and uh, said, you know, Battle of Fort Dearborn Park. So we've uh, participated in celebrations ever since. It opened in 2009, uh, got a historical marker, uh, and so it's not the massacre anymore. It's historically accurate. My goodness, a revisionist history can actually, it's not a bad thing, since history is not truth. History is perspective. There's nothing to be ashamed about in reevaluating perspectives. And so 
Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Uh, this is my medicine bag given to me a long, 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 long time ago. And it's got important things inside here. It's got some pipestone in it. I'm not going to tell you all the things, but two important things is it has some pipestone in it, and it has my deceased cat's myos. Myos is cat in Potawatomi. Real creative, right? Myos, the myos, um, and uh, myos's whiskers. So, important things to for me to. I also carry in my pocket um, Sema tobacco, which always reminds me. I hope I say something to someone that means something. That's my goal. That's my bar. Pretty low, I know, <laughs> but uh, but it's an important one, right? I don't have to reach everybody. I only need to reach one person. And uh, although on occasion I only reach myself. Uh, but uh, it also uh, that I'm representing my ancestors. And they suffered through a lot. You know, life is easy for me. I looked a lot like my Irish American dad. Um, I don't look particularly phenotype, typical Indian or mascot Indian. And uh, so. Uh, I am who I am. I grew up within the community, but I want to represent that community well, uh, represent those ancestors, represent my nation, um, and represent myself well enough that I might get invited back someday. <laughs> Other questions? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's important for you to study history so that you have a context uh, so of what's going on uh, in the world today, in America today, wherever you're interested in today. Uh, but also an opportunity then to um, uh, contribute your perspectives to it. And so that it is, uh, and I don't mean to make it sound like, well, history is going to become this kind of vanilla melting pot kind of thing. No, um, it's uh, uh, contrary to uh, Mayor Giuliani, truth isn't, he said truth isn't truth. Truth is truth. There is truth. History doesn't necessarily always reflect truth. Again, as I said, uh, history reflects perspective. The closer we can get, the more accurate we can get, the more inclusive we can get, um, the better the richer the stories. A lot of history, you know, is um, with no Indian voices, with no um, um, people of color voices at all, with no women's voices, you know, and that is now changing. And that's all extremely exciting for that to be happening and important. And it not just, not just so that we have a more complete textbook, you know, but so that we have a better understanding of where we were, where we are now, and where we're headed. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, there is, um, well, the closest, uh, there's, there's no reservations in Illinois. Notice I didn't say, I didn't mention Michigan, Wisconsin, or Minnesota because there are Indian reservations up there. And uh, because Indians fled up there, a lot of them were allowed to stay. Why were they allowed to stay there and not down here? Because it had been, the timber was the main resource up there. Soil was crummy, couldn't really grow crops very well. Uh, short growing season, the climate's tough. So they clear cut the trees. You can find photos online of a clear cutting. They cut them at about this height. And they had to have a whole process mostly or a lot of Indians were employed of stump removal afterwards but you know the timber barons were just interested in, in you know the easy wood and so so there's reservations up there my community is the closest 
Uh, it's not technically a reservation. We got our reservation stolen from us in the 1860s. So we lived in little pockets, mostly near Catholic churches. So there's a Catholic church up in Hartford, Michigan. There's a Catholic church in Dwajak, Michigan, which is our headquarters now, um, that area there. And there's a Catholic church at Notre Dame. And so um, those were sort of the, so a lot of times we identify ourselves in a smaller setting, a tribal setting, they'll say, well, I'm, they know I'm Pokagon Potawatomi, so I'll say I'm from Hartford, um, Dwajak, or I'm so, my, my, my people come from South Bend. Oh, <laughs> yes. Sure. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and it was interesting when we became Catholic and we got that exception. There were twelve villages along the St. Joseph River, and Pokagans was just one of twelve villages. Then the um, government started coming to the other villages and, and said, "Unless you're a Pokagon, one of Pokagans band, and you're Catholic, you got to move. We're walking you out west." And suddenly, everybody started becoming Catholic. You know, they said, oh, you know, come to think of it, I am Pokagon Pado on me. You know, I was just visiting relatives up here. And so within a few years, those 12 villages all shrunk into one, and that was us. So we, uh, that was suppressed. We never lost that. Um, language was suppressed. We never lost it, but it was suppressed substantially. Spirituality, uh, I can, you know, when I was growing up, so we have uh, Sweat Lodge. We have women's ceremonies. We have um, seasonal uh, activities. We have longhouse ceremony. We have uh, naming ceremonies, um, ceremonies for birth, ceremonies for death. Uh, we have all those things. We don't talk, I, I basically don't talk to the priests a lot about what, um, for instance, we don't believe in hell. Well, what kind of good Catholic doesn't believe in a good hell, right? You know, um, you know. We, we don't, you know, God, God-fearing Christian. I'm not a God-fearing Christian. I don't think the Creator needs to be feared. The Creator's not all that concerned with me, you know. But um, ultimately, uh, that it, it's not something to be afraid of. So there are differences that we just sort of, you know, we don't, uh, I, I know that at weddings, at funerals, there'll be a priest there many times, there'll be the drum there too, right? And there'll be uh, a spiritual leader there too, a pipe carrier. And so we mix the two. Like a lot of Catholicism has particularly been indigenizing uh, over the last few, a couple of decades. And so we've just continued that too. I'm sorry, ma'am, you had your, your arm up? Yeah, yes, yes, it sure did. So this is what happened. Um, is that the Milky Way is our ancestors traveling to the next journey, right? See, there's souls traveling up there. With light pollution, you can't much anymore, but that's them. So uh, if um, what that is, I had an elder tell me, think of a big powwow. Lots of socializing, you get to see your friends. I've been told they get to see my cats again. Um, and uh, dancing. Well, you can't dance unless you lay tobacco down, right? And so y we all go, we don't take anything with us, right? Native or non-native, <laughs> we all go to the next place uh, naked, right? And so if you're a good person, an honorable person, when your bones are put into the ground and your spirit goes up to that place, that afterlife, people will remember you. And I lay tobacco down for my ancestors and for other people all the time. And if I lay tobacco down for them, then they can dance. And so the good people, the great people, the wonderful people, the okay people, they get tobacco laid down, they get to dance. The most shameful thing is to be at the powwow and nobody lays tobacco down for you and you never get to dance, right? You just sit there, right? Other than that, if you don't make it that far, you know, which I'm not sure of the scenario where you don't make it that far. You just return to Mother Earth, right? You just disintegrate. 
and you return to Mother Earth, and it's the cycle of life. But there's not this damnation. There's not this judgment of... Um, but in particular, part of that goes to sort of our philosophy of life, which was very common among Algonquian Indians, was, you know, in the world today, we see a lot of what makes me special. I need to stand out. I need to rise above, right? I need to make my mark. That's not what we lit were about. We wanted to, what kids worried about is not how do I stand out, but they worried about, and we still do, how do I fit in? How do I fit in? How do I contribute to the community? How do I make my uh, ancestors proud? How do I make life better for the people around me? Because that spreads and they make life better for me too, right? So that was our philosophy. So we didn't have a lot of um, sort of that uh, grandiosity until the Peds got here. Of course, we're going to have that story, right? You know. Other questions? Oh, thank you. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you for coming.